What's up everybody? This is Lee coming to you once again from Ashram Not in beautiful downtown Lincoln to today We're in Shelby and we're at the Dragonfly Wine Market. John Karabi's playing tonight. I'm here with Jamie Jamie is the owner of uh, the, the Dragonfly Wine Market here and thanks so much for allowing us to come in and talk to John and uh, it's my pleasure. I, it's going to be I'm a big excited. show. I'm so excited. We're, we're just happy to see this coming to Shelby. Yep. Uh, should be a great show. We've got a good turnout. All the sick tickets have been sold out for months. So it yep. should be just really fun. Awesome, I man. I can't wait. Well, Sitting down with the incredible John Karabi. John, how are you, man? I'm all right, buddy. Man, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak to us today. Long trip. We just talked about his schedule. And uh, it's incredible the amount of miles you're driving, man. <laughs> you must still love it. Yeah, and that beast out there, it's crazy, <laughs> man. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, and, and it was funny, like, I was coming in here to town, and then obviously, I, the way I came in, it's like, I'm like, great. It's on the opposite <laughs> side of the road, so I got to turn that thing around. And, you know, but it's just weird, man. Like, you know, people, just the way people drive, it really makes, driving one of those really makes you aware yeah. of just kind of being uh, just a little polite when you're driving. Right. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like, I, it, it just annoys the hell out of me. Like, when I've got my turn signal on for, like, a half a mile, and people just keep trying to get around me and passing me, and I'm like, sure. I just had it happen coming in. I was trying to get out of the right lane because it was a turn lane, like a block or two back. Yeah. And I had my turn signal on, and I'm like, inching up inching up and then finally i just went you know fuck it I, just, I pulled out and i'm like well whatever and the guy just leaned on his horn and i'm like whatever but, <laughs> but, but you still gotta love it to get out and do it uh, after all these years man especially after covid uh what's it been like after covid you know honestly i i think i i was pretty productive um it really did make me rethink a lot of things. Yeah. Um, it made me rethink the fact that 90% of my income was from touring. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've bun done a bunch of records, but the one thing that I never did was I, I was never really self-reliant with uh, like being able to record myself. Right. So I bought all the shit that I needed. Yeah. And then I, I went online, uh, you know, Pro Tools is actually owned by a company called Avid. Right. So I went on to Avid and I saw that they had online classes mm -hmm. and I, I, I did the classes, um, you know, two, three weeks of, of you know, uh, four, four classes a week, whatever, just enough to get me started. <laughs> and then um, I just said, all right, you know, like I, I was telling my wife, I said, you know, this whole time, had I done this sooner when Pro Tools first came out, like everybody else did, right? Um, I could have gotten through the COVID thing a little easier by just recording music yeah. and throwing it out there for download, right. you know what I mean? And just sure. to supplement, you know, whatever. Sure. And, um, you know, so I did that and then I sat down and I wrote a book. Uh, with a gentleman named Paul Miles, um, and we just signed a deal uh, to have it, it's it's gone through the editing stages, uh, right. so that should be out early next year. Right. Um, yeah. It's called Horseshoes and Hand Grenades, and um, you know, so I was pretty productive. I've got a bunch of material, and what I did, I went into my room and I just I set up a little. Uh, you know, my wife and I kind of looked at, we looked at everything and she was renting a space to cut hair. Right. And then I said, all right, well, we took a little money and we had an enclosed patio in her house and we just converted the in, you know, the patio and made it a hair salon. Oh, wow. And then I took one of the bedrooms that we weren't using and I sold all the furniture, I got rid of it and I just bought a desk and I set everything up. I got my speakers and everything in there and I set up a little home studio. So now I go in, I'll record stuff, and it's been sounding really good, uh, but I record all the stuff, and then I get it to the point where I can't take it any further. Right. And then I email all the files to Marty Fredrickson, um, and then he takes it and he puts his voodoo on it and <laughs> um, makes it sound like a polished professional record. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, I, and then I contacted my label, Rat Pack, and 
and I just said, man, with everything going the way that it went, like I, I just, I, I, I'm kind of rethinking everything. And, and when you really look at the industry right now, like nobody's really selling any records. Right. Um, a guy like me, I'm never going to get on the radio. If I do, it'll be a minimal amount of stations, not really make any sort of dent in anything. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I left the label and they're great people. But I just, I had to look out for me, like sure. my finances, my thing. And I sat and I thought about it and I'm like, well, I got my own studio now, this set up the way I'm doing it. I don't need an advance from a record label to record. Sure. Um, and then most of the press that we've done over the last, you know, five, six, seven, ten years, um, it's less and less magazines that you're in and it's more and more podcasts and right, things right. like that. Sure. And most of the people now are just reaching out to me directly through Instagram, Facebook, whatever, and right. asking me to do podcasts. So I don't even need the label for that. Sure. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm just going to release a single one song with a video, mm -hmm. let it sit for a little bit and then do another single and another video and then yeah. take whatever money I make from that and then invest it in CDs, vinyl, whatever, right. and then sell them at our shows, sure. which is basically where even the, even with the Dead Daisies, a majority of the records we've sold have been through a website right? or, uh, yeah, I mean Amazon, but like once you, once you do a hard product, you can just call Amazon and go, hey, I got this thing, take a photo of it and send it into them and then they'll sell it for you. They take a cut. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> you get the order, you <laughs> still put it in an envelope and right. you do the mailing. So yeah. I'm like, I don't really, I'm just kind of at a point now where I'm like, I, I don't need really any record label. Almost completely self-sufficient. Well, you can do it yourself, yeah. you know, and then at the end of the day, like, when you do do these record labels, a lot of them are 50-50 deals. So when you look at what they're they're really giving you, because they're not even, again, I'm not getting any radio. And if you, you go to any Best Buy or Kmart or Walmart, you're mm -hmm. not going to find a John Karabi record. It's all mail order. Right. So I'm sitting there going, why am I giving somebody half my money? Sure. For, for everything that I can do. Exactly. So I just, Cut you know, the it, it's, 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 it's been weird. So, but I do think I've been, I, <clears throat> during the COVID thing, I was productive. I wasn't doing a lot of shows, but like I said, I taught myself to use Pro Tools. Stuff sounds great that I've recorded. I've got more than half of a record done. Mm -hmm. So I have plenty of songs to, I could re do releases for the next year. Are you, are you constantly writing? Um, I, no, I'm not one of those guys that makes myself go into a room and write. Sure. Like I have to, and it's the most random thing. I could be sitting watching a TV show and I, I, I do this weird thing like where it's like I'm, I hum to myself yeah. and then I grit my teeth back and forth to create like a drum sound. Yeah. So I'm like, so I'll sit there and I'll go, oh, that's a cool riff. And then I'll get up and go. But I may not write something for a month or two. Yeah. And then I'll sit down and I'll write like six things. And I'll start recording them all. Like I've got, when I get home, I've got, you know, probably more than half a record finished. Yeah. And then I've got another probably half or more of record of things that I started recording and I walked away from for a little bit because I I just kind of hit a little bit of a wall. Right. So when I get home, I'll open up everything and I'll just listen. And then if something inspires me, I'll start working on it again. Now, are you looking at um, more of an acoustic sound or more of an electric sound on this stuff? Uh, full band, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm going to have some acoustic stuff. If you go back and you look at all of the records that I've done, um, other than maybe the last two Dead Daisies records. Yeah. But even the first one, there was a song on there called Sleep that I wrote, um, which was very mellow. Yeah. If I could only sleep, I'd finally be awake, awake to see the dream of you and I. And let my just die if I could... yeah. So I, I do love, like, yeah, I mean, as much as I love Sabbath and Zeppelin and, you know, Grand Funk Railroad and all that stuff, I also love James Taylor. 
Yeah. You know, Joni Mitchell, Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young. And, you know, so I love a lot of different stuff, which is another thing that excites me because now I don't have anybody standing over my shoulder going, yeah, I, I don't think you can release that because it doesn't sound like the Motley record. It right. doesn't sound like the Scream record. Yeah. Now I can, I can just write something and throw my name on it. Hey, John Karabi, here's, uh, here's this new country song that I wrote. You know, sure. Check it out. And, you know, and speaking of being excited about things, man, it's got to be incredibly exciting uh, to look back on the drum kit and see your son. Sorry. Tell me about how, you know, he grew up, I, I remember reading in the dirt, um, uh, you know, you wrote some sections in, in the crew book uh, about, um, you know, when uh, you left Motley, you went home and your son was there. Yeah. And now he's playing drums. And you know, if you, if you listen, anybody gets a chance to listen to the One Night in Holly, uh, One Night in Nashville album that you recorded, your son's on drums. Yes. And I mean, <laughs> nailing Tommy Lee's parts, absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> He's a, he, uh, just as a dad, um, my son's been through a lot of shit, you know what I mean? He's been through the divorce and, uh, you know, he, he, um, you know, he was uh, diagnosed with diabetes at a very young age. So he's had diabetes his whole life. He takes like four insulin shots or three insulin shots a day. And, um, so he's dealt with that. Um. And then he had a little bit of a thing when he was in L.A. He was in a car accident and he was prescribed pain pills and he became addicted. And then he progressed into shooting heroin for a year or two. Mm -hmm. and, and But we've got a great relationship. Like he knew that he was struggling with something and I was the first person he called to talk to about it. Yeah. And I said, what do you want to do? You know what I mean? Blah, blah, blah. And then he came out and he's got a beautiful girlfriend now. He's got identical twin daughters who I adore. Wow. Um, and like the only unfortunate thing is, uh, you know, when I did the Daisies thing, it kind of put my solo career a little bit on hold. And so he was, he was kind of bummed. He was like, oh, dad, like we were just getting going. Like what, you know, now you're doing this Daisies thing. So he went out and he played drums with Tantric for a while, mm. and now he's playing with a band from Atlanta um, called Rehab. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but he, I, he still, when I get home, there's a couple tracks that I have that I want him to come in and play drums on. Sure. And then once, you know, once I get, you know, four or five songs, you know, new things out there, I want to work up a set. I want to get my guys back together again and get back out there. But he's he's a great kid. I'm super proud of him. He got his shit together. Um, he's got a great, I mean, and he's working his ass off. He's out on the weekends with rehab, and then he comes right in, and he's working for this, uh, he's doing like construction during the day because he's got a family now. Sure. And he's he's kicking ass. Well, so uh, you know, I couldn't be happier. But it is cool. Yeah. Like I hear these drum fills. I'm on stage, like the Tommy, Tommy drum fill, and I just turn around and I look at him, and he's just back there, like, <laughs> like nothing to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a little bit of a thing, you know what I mean? But he's he's a great kid. He's, yeah. he's I'm very very proud of him. That's awesome, man. Really, and especially the fact that something happens, and you know, the first person he calls, man, it's that's a rare thing. That's that's you know, and and I was just talking to a friend about this the other day. Like a lot of kids. They have a great relationship with their parents, but when they get into a pinch or they do something like, oh, I got my girlfriend pregnant or, oh, I, you know, I'm doing heroin or oh, I got I got arrested for a DUI, like, they don't want to talk to their parents about it. There's that disconnect. Sure. And Ian's always been, like, I haven't always been in a present, present. Sure. force in his thing but we always talk on the phone right almost every day yeah. <clears throat> so it i'm just i think it's a good relationship when he can call me and go dad i know you're going to be really upset with me but you know i've been doing heroin for a year a year and a half and i was like kind of oh, 
what? Right. You know, um, but I helped him through it. He wanted to get help. He talked to me. He came out and he came to live with, well, she's my wife now, but me, and my girlfriend at the time came out to live with us. And he, I, you know, immediately got his shit together. But I'm honest with him. Right. He's honest with me. When when I think he someone wronged him, mm -hmm. I tell him like you you've been screwed over here. Sure. Uh, but when I think he's doing it to somebody, right? I'm not. It's it works the same way. Yeah. So I'm like, dude, you're being a fucking asshole right now. Like you know, pull get your shit together and yeah. do the right thing. Sure. And you know, so I I'm just very very happy and proud that that he thinks enough of me to call me even when he's done something wrong right. and he needs to talk talk to me about That's it. That's awesome, man. So you know, it's a good thing, man. And, and speaking of uh, giving advice, I want to ask you a question. Um, if Don't do it. <laughs> if 2021, John Karabi could go back and talk to 1990 John Karabi and give him some advice, what would you tell him? I would just say... Uh, um, there's, there's, uh, it really, I don't really have a lot of regrets, like, because everything that I've done, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, oh, well, you were in so many different bands, but it wasn't my choice. Yeah. It just happened that way. Sure. I was in The Scream, and I loved that band. You know, we were kicking ass, like, you know, over in England. And, and uh, you know, if, who knew I was going to get a phone call that would turn everything upside down? Sure. If I wouldn't have taken it, um, I think everybody and their grandmother would have said, you're an idiot. Like, it, I mean, Motley at the time was one of the biggest bands in the world. Mm. And it was uh, like I couldn't turn it down. My kid had diabetes. My mom had cancer. Like all this stuff. I'm like, uh. Sure. So I did it. And then when I was in the band, the way they talked about Vince, I never had any thought that they were going to get back with them. You right. know what I mean? Like, so it's just the way my cards were dealt to me and you make the best of it. The only thing that I would say is there's a lot of situations, a lot of times you get into situations. And I think this is just not just for musicians, like even the average Joe, you know what I mean? Like when money comes to play in between a relationship, when money becomes whatever, mm -hmm. you really find out who your friends are. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like people, it, you can be great friends with them, but you know, it's just business Yeah, is the line you hear all the time, you know? And, and I didn't, I did a few things early on in my career with contracts and different things thinking, oh, we're bros, man. They'll never screw me over. Sure. You know what I mean? Just assuming that everybody would look at it the way I look at it. Right. People don't. And that's something that I had to learn. The other thing I had to learn was when I was in Motley, there was a lot of people and Tommy and Nikki told me in the very beginning that this was going to happen. And I was like, no, 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 not my friends, you know? And it was, uh, you know, you're going to find out like people treat you differently because of the situation you're in. And, at first, I didn't think it would happen, and then I, I really kind of realized, oh, like, I, I'm still the same guy. Yeah. Everybody else around me is changing. You know, everybody was started calling me like, hey, dude, can you lend me five grand? Hey, dude, can you get a limo and get us tickets for the Tesla show? And, you know, yeah. hey, dude, can you, you know, I became like this party favor, and then as soon as it was over, like, it was like crickets. But I had a few very tight, like, little circle of friends that were with me before Motley, sure. during Motley, and after Motley. Right. And then I went, oh, okay. So I would tell myself, listen, like, you're going to get this Motley gig. Everybody else is a clinger. 
Mm-hmm. Just th- those little batch of friends that you got, that f- those five or six people that aren't ever going to be afraid to tell you you're an asshole, yeah. whatever. You know, and and that's I think I think really that's it. Like I wouldn't change anything. Everything happened the way it happened, and right. I have actually have it tattooed here. It's it's Italian, but I firmly believe. Like even when shit goes wrong for you, regardless of whether you're a musician, whether you're a plumber, whatever, this phrase says, life is as it should be. Even when something bad's happening, you have to look at it, make some adjustments, move forward, and learn from it. Mm. And I think I have <clears throat> with everything. That's you know what I mean? You know, and I, I don't want to belabor the, the 94 uh, Crew album. You know, if you're watching this, you know, you know the 94 Crew album. In my opinion, the best Crew album ever made. Um, your voice is incredible on it. The sound of it, the way it was produced, everything's incredible about that album. Go check out the 94 Motley Crew album. Hooligans Holiday is still in rotation. One of my favorite songs of all time. Um, but uh, I did an interview with uh, Bruce Kulick recently, mm-hmm. and uh, we were talking about Union. And uh, he said that he felt like that you, I don't know if he was, he didn't want to speak for you, but he said that uh, you seemed to be freer during that period of time to do what you wanted to do creatively than you had uh, with the crew. Well, the thing, the thing with Bruce, I mean, yeah, it would, there was definitely a freedom there because it was a brand new band. There was no confine like you know what i mean like we had some stuff in crew that we had written and everybody else would look at it and go wait what are you guys doing that's sound like anything you've done before i mean it's still to this day if you really look at it like people the one biggest gripe about the thing the record i did with them is it 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 didn't sound anything like motley crew so we were fighting people the whole time right um, so the thing with Union was brand new band, no rules. Yep. Like I, I can do, and we did. Like <clears throat> if you look at the first record, <clears throat> you know we it was pretty pretty straightforward rock. But then we had stuff like October Morning Wind, great song, yeah. and then we had Robin's song at the end of the mm-hmm. thing. It was like we could do whatever we wanted, and Bruce was open to it. Yeah. I can hear your song. Because Bruce and I are, are actually, if you really look at a lot of the, the stuff that we're into, there's a lot of crossbreeding there, like right. Hendrix, Zeppelin, yeah. Mountain, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but even stuff like Yes, uh, you know what I mean, Grand Funk Railroad, like sure. oddly enough. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that's one thing that I've always loved about the bands that I was listening to as a kid. I love ACDC, but I'm not an ACDC. Uh, I like the bands that were, um, for example, uh, you listen to Led Zeppelin IV, mm-hmm. first song, Black Dog. Sure. You know, next song, rock and roll. Next song, Battle of Evermore. It's like, what the, f- <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Uh, you know, they would do Heartbreaker and then do the Rain song. Mm-hmm. Or they would do, uh, it's, everybody says Dire Maker, but it's really a English slang. It's called Jermaker. It's like, did you, did you make her when you were right. at the bar last night? <laughs> but um, uh, so they, you know, and that was kind of reggae. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and so Queen was another one. Even Aerosmith, to a degree, like they would do, they would, they weren't afraid to add piano. They weren't afraid to, you know. And so I was more, I was always more intrigued with bands that could go. There was a thread. It sounded like them, but if you went from track to track, it, it, to me, it kept it interesting. Sure. It, it, there, there was all these different modes or 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 or. Uh, influences with music 
even humble pie very acoustic at times and mm. then in your face kick kick your ass so i was always into that kind of stuff and that was and bruce was the same way yeah so it was like okay I don't have to be the lead singer of Motley Crue. This band that's had a gazillion, sold a gazillion records for the last 15 years. Yeah. I, there's no confines. Mm -hmm. Union's a brand new band. There's, and and that's kind of why I did my acoustic record as a solo. Yeah. Everybody, you know, and I I I, I laugh. Everybody goes, you know. Oh, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. I go, well, both of my feet look like Swiss cheese. I've been doing it my whole career. <clears throat> but I wanted to do my first solo record was acoustic so that it was like taking a giant eraser and erasing everything sure. that I'd done prior to that. Yeah. Now when I do my next record, full-blown solo record, nobody really knows what to expect. Sure. Yeah. And I like that. I like, now I can do anything. I can do acoustic, electric, you know, be cool. It wouldn't be that unusual for me to do a record and have side A be electric mm -hmm. and then flip it over and side B be all acoustic. You know, I, do it. I love, uh, I love where you can see your, your different influences. Like I was talking to someone earlier today about the live album again in, uh, in Nashville. Um, it's got a, uh, an Aerosmith live vibe to it. And you know, I I, re I love. I, That's I can exactly hear. what I was going for. Well, it it, really, it comes through. Well, because yeah. I only had I had a very limited budget to record the record, and it was literally, it if there would have been one zero like one problem with anything recording anything or whatever, mm -hmm. it would have train wrecked the whole thing. I had one day to get it done. Well, it, it really came through, man. It's, it sounds amazing. Like I said, it's got that vibe from the Aerosmith Live stuff, and, and I love it. The, the, the uh, track you did on Quaternary. The, Friends. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's got a Beatles-esque vibe to it, and uh, one of my favorite tracks from that era. Um, and I've only got a couple more minutes here, but I, I just wanted to ask you one more question. Sure. Have you gotten to the point as John Karabi that you're able to separate the performer from the man I've always been able to separate um, I got married Ian's mom uh, I was in a band with her brother I fell in love with her and we, we got married when I was fuck, 19 20 years old she already had a daughter mm -hmm. so at 20 I was and I've always been kind of uh, I don't want to say the caregiver but the caregiver so I've always been more about, you know, this, I, as I love this, mm -hmm. what I do, but it's a job. Yeah. It's a job. You know what I mean? I love my job sure. and I, I enjoy doing it, but it's a job. And then when I go home, that's my other job. It's to be a uh, dad, husband, father, whatever, you know, and. So when I go, like, I'll get done this run. I, you know, after tonight, I head down to Fort Myers and then I go back to Nashville. And I got like, you know, week and a half before my next run. And, but when I'm home, I'm home. I never leave my house. I love being in my house. I love being in my studio. I love just hanging out with my wife and watching movies and just, sure. you know, cooking dinner at home. And, yeah. you know, so I've always been kind of low key. So I never really got caught up in any of the trappings of being, you know, and that may be one of the reasons why I'm not more popular. You know, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe I'm not, you know, oh, you know, Karabi didn't fucking wrap his Corvette around a tree. I'm, you know, sure. whatever. I've just never been that guy. You know, I, like I'm not that Lord, you know, Tommy and Nikki, they're like, oh, check out our testerosis. How much did that cost? 265,000, I go, why? Yeah. Buy a fucking vet and then a home. Yeah. Like, you know, like whatever. I, yeah. it, that's it's just, sure. but that's how my brain is wired. Yeah. You know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I'm on tour. You know, everybody's like, oh, right, you know, whatever. I had dinner last night. I didn't finish it. 
I got a to-go box. It's in my refrigerator for later today. There you go. And it's like, I'm just, I, that's just the way I'm wired. I've always been that way. I'm not going to change. I'm 62 now, whatever. So I've never had an issue separating that from that. And even if when I'm on stage, I think for the most part, I'm still the same guy that if you were just standing out there by my coach, I'm, I'm inappropriate. I tell stupid jokes that are just totally inappropriate. I cuss. I, you know, I have my way I think. And then when I get on stage, I'm the exact same person because I warn everybody, if you got any kids here, you might want to get some cotton because <laughs> I ain't changing shit because, well, for whatever. Well, I, you know, so I don't really, you know, it well, is what it is. Well, uh, I can't thank you enough for taking some time to talk to us today, man. And, uh, uh, continued success you know I, I've been a fan forever thank you and um, a lot, there's a lot of us out there so uh, good luck with the show tonight man and um, yeah this you. is uh, uh, this I you know it, I know they said it's sold out but I'm hoping the PA is loud enough to accommodate the uh, the message I'm sure to be good man thank you so much right, John bro. take care buddy right, see you Cruising for a bruising.